Okay, we want to apply this idea now. And we're going to start by applying it to nonlinear elasticity. But we are going to apply it to a general situation where we don't have just a ball, which is a rigid object, but we have a deformable body viewed either in the reference or in the current configuration. All right? So that's the setting. Okay? We are going to extend this idea. Or I should say these ideas to elastic, which means, of course, deformable. bodies. Okay? And in particular, uh, of those few examples I put up a couple of slides ago, we are going to study the case of um, what it means for a body to be in elastic equilibrium, right, or mechanical equilibrium. Okay? All right. So what this means then, if, if this is what we want to do, uh, you observe that that argument that we um, sort of sketched out in the previous slide was in terms of energy. So we need to define some such, uh, some such energy here, okay? And in particular, uh, we need to define an energy that is applicable to the body to the whole body, right? whether it's here or in its current configuration. Okay, so the, so, so the goal here, where we need to start really, is to first define a suitable energy. Okay, right, just in the context of elasticity. Uh, define a suitable, en uh, so let me say that. Define a suitable energy uh, for an elastic body. Right, nonlinearly elastic. Now, we, we already know about an energy, right? We've used it very often in our study of uh, nonlinear elasticity. In fact, after a point, our study of nonlinear elasticity pretty much revolved around this notion of an energy. Okay? You recall that we have a, we have the strain energy density. Okay? Psi. And uh, in general, written as a function of f, of course, we know things beyond this, right? Though I'm writing it as a function of f, we know that all our, uh, you know, our fundamental requirement of material frame invariance holds, right? So though I'm writing it as a function of f, we know that it's a special function of f, and we know how to write all that, that, that special aspect of it, right? So let's assume that all of that holds, okay? All right. Now, um, so we could, okay, so we could go ahead and write this as um, psi, which is, um, okay, just, just for the moment, I'm going to write F as isotropic tensor plus displacement gradient, okay? Now, um, you know, we may look at that in the reference configuration or the current configuration, right? We may consider it in either setting. We know that F goes between the reference and current configurations. Okay, but you note that since we're talking about this, since what we've written here, written here is the strain energy density, we are really talking about the energy per unit volume in some little neighborhood of our position, either in the reference configuration or the current configuration, okay? 
when we consider psi, it does not give us the total energy of the body. Okay? Now, of course, you've probably seen how to get around that minor impediment. You may say, well, that's no problem. We just integrate it over the body, right? We get the total strain energy, and that's right, okay? So, uh, um, to get total strain energy, integrate, right? over omega naught, okay? In particular, you may say, well, let's just do that, right? You may say integral over omega naught, psi function of F, D capital V, right? That gives us the total strain energy, right? Now, it turns out that um, when bodies, when elastic bodies are at equilibrium, they are uh, at equilibrium or not, depending not just on the strain energy, but also on the forces applied to the body. In particular, if we have a traction boundary, right, we know that there is a uh, traction vector, okay? And in the current configuration, we would have this. Okay, and we know that that traction vector is fixed, right? Okay? Right. Um, or actually, sorry, capital T here would have to denote the total force, right? So that's the total force on that area vector, okay? And this would all I uh, would also have to write here that this is the force on little n d a, right? And we've studied about the implications about, of all this. So it turns out that we need to include that effect. Not only that, but we also need to include the fact that there is a body force. Okay, there is a body force which, in the current configuration, we've denoted as B F. And um, in the reference configuration, we've seen that this is just the uh, Jacobian of the deformation, right, or the determinant of the deformation gradient times Bf. So bodies are at equilibrium or not, if they are elastic bodies, depending upon the, the traction applied to their surfaces as well as the body force, right, the, the effect of the forcing. Okay, it sort of makes sense. I mean, how can we talk about the equilibrium of, of a body uh, if we don't account for the fact that there are uh, forces acting on it or, you know, that, that there are internal body forces, right, like gravity, right? How can we talk about equilibrium without accounting for those? Okay, so we need to account for them. Sorry. In order to get that right, what we need to do is um, include... essentially the work of external forces, okay? So what that lets us do is, to, what, what, that, what that means is that we need to integrate over omega naught, not, not just psi function of f, dv, okay? But we also need to include the effect of the work, okay? So the work done is integral over omega naught, the work done by the body force, is that, where u is the displacement, okay? And I have j bf because I'm talking of things in the reference configuration minus integral over the traction boundary of um, T 
um, dot n dA, okay, where T is now the traction vector, all right. Now, because we know that this, that, that F here is written as isotropic tensor plus partial derivative of u with respect to x. What we observe is that this energy that we've written on the right hand side is uh, dependent on the displacement field u. I'm going to use the same symbol pi for it as we did before, okay? There are some things I need to say about this energy we've written. Um, let me say that in the in in a few remarks. Okay. What we've written here is another version of a thermodynamic potential. We first saw a thermodynamic potential, the Helmholtz potential, when we studied um, thermomechanics. Okay. This is a thermodynamic potential. called the Gibbs potential okay. also just like the Helmholtz potential it's often called the Gibbs free energy okay the other thing you note is that this gives us the energy in the body, but mathematically speaking, this object that we've written pi, depending upon u, is not a function, okay? It is a functional. Okay? And the difference between a function and a functional is that whereas for a function, you could uh, work with, you know, a function, say, f of x, right? How does a function work? It takes a point value of x. It says, okay, you give me an x, you give it a value of x, and it gives you back the value of f, right? So you may say, uh, if that is x here, uh, then that is the value of f I get, okay? And maybe a function was that, okay? A functional is different, okay? In 1D, it is as if you need to know, uh, in 1D or maybe, or in 3D, or even in three dimensions, right? In three dimensions, a functional is an object to know which you need to know an entire function u, okay? All right? So a functional pi is a functional of u, okay, where u, um, in this case we know that u is a, it can be a function of little x in time, right? u itself is a function, okay? What this means is that to evaluate the functional pi, it is not enough to just have a point value of its argument like we have in this case, in the case of a function, okay? Whereas in this case, we have a function f of x. This is very different. Pi is a very different object, okay? For pi, in order to evaluate pi, you need to know the entire function defined over the entire domain, okay? What this means is that to evaluate pi, we need 
u defined over all of omega naught, right? And maybe omega naught cross uh, the interval 0 to t, right? If you are interested in time as well, okay? So, u is a mapping from omega naught cross the time interval, okay? And what we are doing is to draw its arguments from here, right? x comes from omega naught, little t comes from the uh, time interval 0 to t. So u is a mapping from those sp spaces into the space of, uh, into three-dimensional space, right, into R3 because u is a vector, okay? Now, it is common uh, to uh, recognize that the function u may have certain mathematical properties, right? Like by, by mathematical properties, it may be something as simple as saying, well, maybe u is polynomials or it's um, exponential functions or harmonic functions or something else, okay? So what we will often also do is to say that u belongs to S, right? Where S is what we think of a, what we mean, what we mean by S is that it represents a function space, okay? example polynomials, polynomials in position, okay? All right, and, and we know how, how we get this, right? This works, uh, right? This, this idea works because we already think of u as depending upon position. Right? So what this says is that, well, maybe we want to just think about u as depending, you know, having some polynomial dependence upon position, okay? This is what gives us the idea of, of a function space. This means now that u can be written as polynomials in x, right? Or maybe, like I said, maybe other functions, right? Exponentials or trigonometric functions or whatever, okay? So this is an idea we will often use. In this sense, the functional pi is a mapping from the space S into another space. Now, what kind of space does pi map into? What are the, what are the values that you get for pi finally? Remember, pi is an energy, okay? Or a, or a thermodynamic potential, right? Which is a scalar, okay? So pi is a mapping from the, our, our function space S into R. Okay, all right. So we have this idea of a functional that we've denoted as pi. I made the point that it is um, in a broader sense understood as a thermodynamic potential. It's called the Gibbs potential or the Gibbs free energy. And um, we also made the point that unlike a function, to know pi, we need to know an entire function itself. Right? It's not like we could just have a point value of its argument and thereby evaluate pi. No, we need to know its argument over the entire domain, right? Over the entire domain. Okay, so this is a fundamentally different type of mathematical object. When we come back in the next segment, we are going to understand what it means to take derivatives of this type of an object. Okay, so a thought that I'm going to leave you with is how do we define a derivative of pi with respect, WRT for with respect to u? Note that this is not simple, right? Because you need to talk about what, we need to talk about what it means to take a derivative with respect to an entire function, okay? So, all right, when we come back, we will try to understand this question a little better and try to define this idea of a derivative.